So I'm David Foster. I'm currently uh, the head of lifts, transit, bikes, and scooters. And I'm also acting as its vice president of engineering as well. You know, the world of AI is obviously evolving very rapidly, but some of the broader elements in which AI can touch us do have both deeper um, meaning for humanity and also require some more careful thought and in some cases policy regulation. So I think topics such as this one are definitely of interest for myself and also for a lot of the population. Yeah, it's over the years and the different roles I've been in, um, one thing I've, I've sort of become very aware of is it typically doesn't make sense to develop a technology and then try and fit it to a product. Sometimes innovation does come around that way. You get a technology breakthrough. It may take a number of years until one figures out quite how you utilize that, or you may need other corresponding pieces of technology to enable that overall solution. But at the end of the day, I typically prefer to start with the need, with a, uh, an unmet need that a consumer or the public or a service may have or a business may have, and then try and engineer towards solving that need in a novel manner. And that typically requires uh, a heavy sort of focus on industrial design, on user experience, on the value to the consumer and also increasingly in today's age in iteration in the market so especially with pure software but also even hardware products now are much more agile than than they used to be in the past So with the role at Lyft, what, what's one of the surprising considerations that I had to think about to ensure success you know, relative to design or form or the function behavior in, in the product? So one of the interesting things for me at Lyft, I think, is that unlike most of the uh, companies I've worked in before, product spaces I've been involved in, we both uh, design and build products, both hardware and software and, and combined, and we operate them. And so that means that unlike many product companies where they design a product and sell it to a consumer or a business, um, we are actually operating our own products and we have multiple customers. So it's, it's the end consumer who might ride a bicycle or a scooter, it's the city in which those fleets of vehicles operate, and then it's our own internal operations staff who have to make sure that those vehicles are always where people need them and in good working order. And so it's both in some ways a more complex problem to solve than the traditional product development problem but also it offers up opportunity for new technologies such as AI to be helpful in ways that aren't necessarily, you know, directly connected to the product itself. We could use AI in how we operate our fleets, for instance, and that's more hidden from the public eye than uh, visible to the public eye. So at Lyft, we definitely believe that the problem of autonomous vehicles is one that you can't solve on your own. It's going to have to be solved in collaboration with other companies, with uh, cities and regulators such as the NHTSA, and with governmental bodies as well. And so we've just actually launched a competition to create a very large data set and it, that essentially allows us to model the behavior of 
vehicles, pedestrians, cyclists, etc., in the real world. And if we can model those behaviors using data that we collect from thousands of miles, tens of thousands of miles of lift cars with uh, sensors installed on them, then we can use those modeled behaviors to then train the models running in the autonomous vehicles as to how do they react to that situation. So our hope is that by both working collaboratively um, with others, by opening up this competition to research and academia, and by sharing the results, that we can broadly uh, speed up the progress in terms of developing autonomous vehicles. So I think, I mean, when you think of autonomous vehicles and mobility, a number of things may spring to mind. At the far end of, of that trajectory are vehicles that either reposition themselves autonomously when no one is in them so that they can be at the right places at the right times, or that are actually driving real uh, customers around. But along the path to that point, there are going to be many advances that I think AI will enable across fields of both allowing us to predict effectively where our fleets of micro-mobility vehicles need to be at particular times during the day, to helping to locate them when they go missing, and also enabling us to have those fleets in the best operating conditions possible. So I think these advances, which are already coming now, will come steadily over the upcoming years, and it won't be a sudden transition from something that is obviously, you know, not AI autonomous to something that is. So in terms of, of technologies that can have significant impact here, um, communications is critical, both communications from the perspective of uh, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to cloud, vehicle to customer, etc., and location. Our micro mobility vehicles typically operate in what we call urban canyons, so uh, surrounded by skyscrapers, which means they don't have typically good views of of clear sky, which makes some of these problems harder to do. So both uh, technologies for communication for location, for collaboration. The more information that these vehicles can share with each other and leverage, the more effective the systems we can build. So I think here, interoperability is key. Um, AI is typically evolving today in isolated islands, i.e. most of our cars aren't talking directly to our home and certainly aren't talking to our home without our explicit input to that AI in the vehicle. I think ultimately that will happen uh, because we have to assume that AI is going to operate in a heterogeneous world with a lot of non-AI driven uh, either you know, consumers or other devices or vehicles or whatever it may be. So interoperability is going to be key. The ability to be adaptive and predictive and context aware is going to be key. And I think that today people might be nervous about AI uh, talking unaided, let's say, from our car to our home or to our work because of concerns around security or identity or intent. Um, but using AI so that, you know, I can ask my car to turn on the lights or the heat at my house on the way home, so I'm showing intent and I'm showing context, I think many people would be comfortable with that type of an approach today. Again, this will evolve over time. I think
think the real answer to this one depends heavily on what that initial experience is. If as a consumer, I buy a product and my initial experience with that product is a good one and I, I enjoy it and it's fit for purpose. And then over time, it seamlessly gets better in terms of how it performs. Um, then I'm going to be even more uh, happy with that product and more likely to continue to use it and maybe to buy additional ones that are similar. If on the other hand, the first product version that I get is fundamentally unworkable um, or unreliable or otherwise not fit for purpose and I'm ju just being used as essentially as a guinea pig to help develop the AI on that product that I'm not going to have a good experience with it, most likely. And I'm going to probably stop using it and stop recommending it and uh, maybe dispose of it. So I think critically, a lot of it comes down to the initial experience. And if you can then make it a product where it gets better over time, then I think uh, consumers respond to that very well. So I think already today, you know, there is some public perception on AI, which is driven either by headlines of where AI has gone wrong in some sense, or by science fiction films over the years. Um, and none of that probably leads to a sense of calm and uh, happiness with AI taking increasingly broad roles in the world around us. That being said, I think many consumers are already uh, not necessarily aware that AI is in the world all around them today and it's doing useful things for them but it isn't necessarily being trumpeted as, oh, AI allowed my uh, phone to take a better picture, for instance, or allowed my calendar to integrate more effectively with uh, my navigation system in my car. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful about pushing the words AI for AI's sake and instead to focus on the benefits that we're actually bringing to consumers and to the public that are enabled by AI, but are not there purely as a means to serve the technology of AI. So AI to me is part of a process which we can use to take input from different uh, sensors or signals. So those could be auditory or visual, positional, balance wise, etc., and to turn that into meaningful output that then might drive motors or position or brakes or something of that nature in mobility. Um, in the same way that I don't believe personally that a single form of input device, i.e. voice versus keyboard versus touch or throttle or whatever it may be in a vehicle, that a single input mechanism uh, is sufficient. I think that AI will be used to help aggregate many different inputs that a human might make into a vehicle for mobility, combine those with inputs that the vehicle itself is sensing around road conditions, traffic hazards, et cetera, and then turn those into meaningful outputs that are either giving feedback to the human through a different piece of uh, output technology or are themselves directing the vehicle or another vehicle to take a different action. So I definitely believe that policymakers play a clear role and a very necessary role in, in regulating mobility today. 
Um, I believe personally that AI is going to exist in a very heterogeneous world where uh, vehicles may contain AI elements, may be entirely autonomous, but may also be entirely non-autonomous, i.e. human driven and with little AI present. And to exist in that very heterogeneous, very dynamic environment, we really need the policymakers and the regulators to help establish standards and policies that set the rules for how AI can interact with non-AI driven devices. I think that today, if you wanted to build a city that was entirely full of autonomous vehicles with very regulated pedestrian paths and very constrained conditions, you could absolutely do that. The technology is there today, but that isn't the world that we live in and won't be for some time to come typically. So the role of policymakers therefore is, is key in terms of helping educate both consumers and companies as to how AI should interact with uh, non-autonomous or AI-driven mobility. I don't think in uh, personally that today one would say that the policymakers are completely on top of, of this challenge. Um, one of the reasons for that, though, is simply that AI is evolving so quickly in its capabilities and potential that it's very hard for regulators to keep track of everything and both come up with a set of regulatory and policy uh, decisions that are both you know, receptive to leveraging the technology, um, but also uh, fully encompassing of, of what its potential can be. Um, so I definitely see this as an iterative process. Uh, some countries are moving faster than others in this respect. Some states might be moving faster than others here in the US. Um, and I do see this as, as being very much iterative over the next coming years as the technology evolves, the policies and the regulations are going to continue to evolve around it. Um, and hopefully they can do so in a way that enables it, but also does so with safety and uh, order <laughs> at hand. I tend to think there'll be a mixture of, of different uh, things happening here. If you just look at the non-AI mobility world of, of cars or even uh, you know, electric bicycles today, e-assist bicycles, there are different regulations in different countries and at times different regulations in different states in the US that make perfect sense in the context of the location that they're at, but that don't necessarily agree with each other or across borders. Um, whereas in other areas, there is a standard regulation that may be common certainly across an entire country or maybe multiple countries, um, such as you know the adoption of seatbelts, for instance, uh, which has been pretty much a worldwide standard for many, many years now. So I see some of these standards evolving to be common ones where both the need for the standard makes sense and the local conditions uh, also uh, fit to that. And in other cases where local conditions may differ, you may have differing standards, differing policies that have to be adhered for with different vehicles and different systems. Yeah, so I think one of the barriers to adoption for AI uh, at higher levels of function and uh, more widespread in with consumers is, is going to be trust. Um, trust typically is earned slowly over a period of time, and it can be lost very quickly when something goes wrong. Um, and so uh, we're not going to be able to market AI as being instantly trustable 
or to prove from a technological perspective that it is trustable in all cases, that trust is going to have to be earned over time. So um, I believe that, you know, for some time to come, uh, humans are going to be interacting with, with their vehicle one way or another. As, as we move uh, through the different levels of vehicle autonomy, today humans are required to be there and are required to be interacting with the vehicle in order to take over when situations demand it. Um, and I think it's going to be some time uh, before the human can be completely out of the loop uh, in a moving vehicle. Um, so therefore that human sort of machine interaction is going to be critical. Uh, how do you alert a human when their input is needed, when a decision has to be made that the AI system is not capable of making? How do you give them, give them enough context around that decision and enough warning uh, and the tools that they need in order to make the decision. Um, and so even if this decision might be the sort of decision that we make thousands of times a second subconsciously if we're driving or riding a bicycle, now you've changed the paradigm and uh, that human machine interface and how the AI communicates with the human is going to be critical. Thinking in general around the framework that was, was created of the four levels of AI development, efficiency, personalization, reasoning, and exploration. Um, I see us clearly today in, in many different industries and, and certainly in the mobility one, uh, using AI today in the efficiency sense. It makes perfect sense to augment uh, our brain capability with AI um, and allow us then to either operate more safely or less stressfully uh, to drive our vehicle around uh, a town. And uh, now we're starting to move into personalization where um, as we discussed earlier, you know, if my car knows where I need to go when I get into it, then that's very context aware for me. And that is a useful service and something that I would see benefit in. I think we're still some time away from the latter two phases uh, of reasoning and, and exploration. Uh, you know, reasoning to me might be when your car can fully uh, take you autonomously from place to place across a wide variety of uh, situations, weathers in the context of non-AI, non-autonomous vehicles and do all of that safely and more efficiently than a human can. That reasoning phase is going to take longer to come around. And then the exploration phase, the idea where you might send a mobility vehicle into a place that has never been modeled before, that where the dynamics aren't understood um, is, is further off still, but one could certainly imagine that world eventually coming along. I think in, in, a, in a sense, I'm surprised at quite how quickly AI is evolving. Um, our capabilities uh, are evolving sort of at, oftentimes at a, a rate well beyond what Moore's law might have said would happen in, in past decades, for instance, because we're not only evolving things in, in hardware and technology, but we're evolving things very rapidly on the software side as well, allowing us to uh, compute better inference with, with uh, nominally similar hardware. Um, what worries me is AI-based systems that are uh, controlling critical things and are thrown into the market 
before they are fully either developed or regulated uh, in some sense or another. Um, I do still think that, uh, you know, the human brain is, is a marvelous piece of computing equipment and we don't quite fully understand all of the calculations that we are subconsciously making as we go about the world today. Uh, and therefore, how do we model those so that AI can make equivalently good decisions? And how do we model the decisions where there is no good answer to the problem? And the only answer is essentially a, a, a one that has negative connotations for someone or something. Um, those problems will take quite a bit longer for us to work our way through, I think, uh, and to establish the right regulations and, and laws around. Um, and so I would be concerned that maybe at times we try and run a little bit too quickly here.